account, the uh, crimes uh, by officers against civilians will continue unabated. People are a product of their upbringing. You know, we're not born racist or sexist or homophobic. You know, we are taught these things growing up, and police officers are no different. They've been raised in the same environment the rest of us in this country have. Now, once they get on the department and they take an oath that they're not going to do this, well, you, yeah, you take an oath, which is nice, but you can't eliminate the way you've been raised. So now you get out there and now you're under the, 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 the job or responsibility of eliminating crime. I'm going to solve the crime problem here. So I've got to find out who the bad guys are. Now, if you look at the media, who they portray as being the bad guys, using blacks and other minorities. Those are the bad guys you sell television. So now you're going to the street with this in your mind. And that's what you're going to be out there stopping. That's what gets stopped. Now, the department did a demographic study based on the fact that myself and other officer went to the grand jury, and we've been to the FBI about these, these types of stops, too, and the fact that profiling is occurring in the police department. Well, I would say it's both a problem, uh, you know, inherent in the judiciary as well as, and perhaps most importantly, it's a problem um, of society as a whole. Um, the judiciary didn't pass. Um, the incredibly harsh uh, drug uh, sentencing laws. Um, the judiciary is not responsible for the overwhelming public support for incredibly punitive responses to the problems that plague poor communities of color. Um, and, you know, the public has by and large been supportive of those politicians who have, you know, demanded a crackdown on crime and competed with each other to prove how tough they are on crime and criminals. Um, we as a society have all been complicit in that. And in fact, I would argue that the civil rights community, uh, to a large extent, has been complicit in the war on drugs by not making it its number one priority today. Uh, the fact that, you know, in 1982, uh, when Re Ronald Reagan declared the war on drugs were only about 330,000 people behind bars, and we now in the United States have an incarceration rate that's, you know, the highest in the world, um, and, you know, we have an incarceration rate that's worse than South Africa at the height of apartheid, and virtually everyone who's behind bars is folks of color. Um, this should be, in my view, the number one priority of the civil rights community, but for the most part, the civil rights community has been preoccupied with attacks on affirmative action um, and lack of civil rights enforcement and a number of other very important pressing issues, um, but has not, in my view, given the war on drugs and racial bias in the criminal justice system the attention it deserves. So all of us, I think, um, are complicit um, in you know, the phenomenon of mass incarceration we see today. I don't believe there's ever been a, a study that has been completed regarding uh, this subject, but I think that this is just one of many spokes that have made a difference or an impact on these targeted communities. These same targeted communities that we speak of are also the same ones that will have limited academics available. They won't have computer programs. They have limited libraries inside of those communities. I think that you'll also find at the same time, those will be the communities that will also have many advertisements, billboards, to talk about cigarettes and alcohol use. You'll also look into those communities and you'll find that those communities on every other block, they'll have a liquor store that's there. The kids will actually be encouraged to go into that liquor store because the liquor store will sell candy and gum so that they'll have a reason to want to come to that establishment and feel comfortable moving inside of a liquor store. But when you move to the upper middle class, you'll find that there is an absence of liquor stores. There is an absence of billboards that promote smoking and that promote alcohol use. So I think there's a, there's a number of, of societal issues uh, that we have a responsibility to take a look at. And in turn, I think with those other activities happening, it also heightens the awareness of law enforcement. And then law enforcement plays their role as well inside of these targeted communities as they are now enforcing the law, but they are enforcing it in such a way that it is not to the same as you would find in some of your upper or more affluent communities, such as here in Marin County. One thing that we've seen uh, in both the federal and the state uh, criminal justice systems is the discriminatory uh, law concerning uh, crack cocaine. 
And this was something that has been widely debated in Congress, uh, in, in court proceedings, and here in California. And <clears throat> what we saw is that there was a state law and a federal law which essentially provided greater punishments for people who were charged with possession or sale of crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. And when you look behind the, um, the labels crack cocaine and powder cocaine, what we found is that overwhelmingly uh, Caucasians use powder cocaine just out of preference and that African Americans and people of color were using crack cocaine. And so again, we had a law that on its face uh, did not appear to be discriminatory, but as applied had a discriminatory impact. And, and this was an, an issue that was, that was raised uh, uh, a number of times, and certainly there is evidence to support, that, support the fact that it was a discriminatory law. On the other hand, I mean, there were arguments that this law uh, simply was outlaw outlawing a, a more dangerous version of crack. And so, you know, that was the, the debate that went back and forth on, on that issue. Probably the most striking evidence of racial bias uh, in the drug war is the disparity in sentencing under the federal uh, guidelines for crack versus powder cocaine. There's a 100 to 1 uh, disparity in the sentencing for crack versus powder cocaine. So you can receive a sentence um, you know, that is 10 to 100 times greater um, for distributing the same amount of crack as compared to the same amount of powder cocaine. And it's the same substance. <laughs> the primary difference is that um, cocaine is, you know, typically associated with white drug use and crack is typically associated with black drug use although you know that in itself um, is a little bit of a myth um, you know whites use crack <laughs> um, and blacks use powder cocaine um, so you know drug use isn't as racially segregated as many people imagine however drug enforcement has been um, uh, racially uh, segregated, and it has been primarily, indeed overwhelmingly, African Americans who have been prosecuted for uh, possession or distribution of crack cocaine, and as a result, they are the ones who are facing these extraordinarily harsh sentences. But my understanding is actually that whites use more rock cocaine or crack cocaine than blacks do. Is that right? So they use more, but who gets stopped and searched is the issue. And then based on that, you know, who has a chance to go to some type of rehabilitation and who does not? If you're able to afford an attorney, you're able to afford to ask a request that I want to go to rehabilitation and you can afford to pay for that yourself, you're going to get off versus someone who cannot afford an attorney. They go to a public defender and they have no money for treatment and then the treatment in the system itself is so backed up that people can't get treatment if you're just a person on the street they're going to keep reoccurring, sure. But again, the studies have shown that actually whites use more rock cocaine than blacks do. Um, when you look at where the police are, who they're, who, who they're arresting, for what drugs people are getting arrested, you'll see that um, it's not uh, sort of the cocaine users in the hills that are getting arrested, but it's the small time dealers on the streets that are getting arrested for the same drugs. And um, then you look at the way uh, district attorneys make decisions, you look at the way police, police make decisions, the way district attorneys make decisions and judges, and you'll see that at every stage they're making decisions to be harsher on people of color than they are white, uh, 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 white people. One of the most stunning statistics that I've recently seen concerning racial disparities uh, is the fact that 15% uh, of illegal drug users are African American, yet almost 40 percent of persons arrested for drug-related offenses are African American. And so it's not, as some uh, people might suggest, that, that there are more African Americans using drugs and therefore that they're more likely to be arrested. It's just the opposite. There are fewer African Americans uh, using, using illegal drugs, yet they're arrested at three times the rate of whites. And so when you look at that kind of disparity in you look at the impact of race, I mean, there's only one conclusion that makes sense, and that is that there are tremendous uh, inequities in terms of how the law is applied. 
I went to, I graduated from Yale Law School in 1993. Um, I grew up in the South. I had never been north of Kentucky before I went to law school. I got there, I had never seen so much drug abuse as went on among the undergraduates at Yale. Literally across the street and two blocks away, there was also drug abuse in the housing projects. If a kid, 19 year old kid, got caught doing drugs at Yale, they were considered to be experimenting with drugs. Maybe they go to drug rehab or whatever, get their lives turned around. Those kids went on to become doctors, lawyers, accountants, the president of the United States, etc. Two blocks away, a 19 year old caught doing drugs is a drug dealer, a drug pusher, and they went to prison. This is the way the country works. This is the way the system works. We know, statistics have shown over and over again, there is no more drug abuse happening in the inner city than in the suburbs. If you really want to catch a bunch of drug abusers, don't go on a housing project, go on a frat house. You'll get all the drugs you want and all the arrests you want. But the system knows that if any police department sent its drug unit onto Harvard's campus and arrested the sons and daughters of privilege, the police chief would lose his job by Monday morning. Um, first, the problem of drug crime is defined in a highly racialized manner, which results in the concentration of law enforcement resources in communities of color. Um, the Kennedy Commission, Justice Kennedy, uh, recently headed up a an ABA commission on criminal justice in which they investigated um, um, issues relating to mass incarceration and the war on drugs and they found um, what many researchers have known for a long time that drug use and drug sales um, is relatively equal across racial lines mm -hmm. that relatively equal proportions of African Americans, whites, Latinos and Asian Americans engage in both drug use and drug sales. Um, but law enforcement resources are almost entirely concentrated in African American and Latino communities. Well, I think that you'll find inside of the prison system here in the state of California that many of the individuals that are incarcerated come from lower middle class uh, citizens. And it is, I believe, based on economics. Uh, although they have committed a crime and they have violated a, a rule or a condition of parole, so they are legitimately being brought into our systems. But I think that the system of society has put together in its totality is where the real problem starts. And it goes all the way back to when we first started our family units and the breakdown of the family units in our inner cities. And I think when you find that we now have such things as Proposition 13, which has closed down playgrounds, which has stopped YMCAs from being able to be in our communities, providing positive role models, teaching our young people how to socialize with others. I think these are many of the things that go on. Our after school programs being shut down. And they have had a lasting effect on certain communities. Now they are those communities that are in the upper middle class that they will be able to pay to still provide those same level of services for their young people as they grow up. And I think that we are now today seeing that clear uh, impact of that lack of service to those communities. As you say, when you look inside of our prisons today, many of those folks, they come from families that are lower middle class. So the department did a study on this. Now the officers knew at the time that the study was being done that they were being monitored. They actually, every time they made a, a car stop out there, they had to put on the computer their ethnicity and the sex of the person that they were stopping and the reason for the stop. Now, after the officers knew they were being stopped, according to the department's own study, they're saying that the black population in San Jose was 3.3%. The number of blacks being stopped, though, the percentage is 7%. It's more than double. It's more than double. This is after we also knew they were being watched. For Hispanics, their population was 30%, yet they were 41% of the stops in San Jose. The department's excuse was this. Well, you see, there's a side of the town, the east side, is where we assign most officers, and that's where most of the minorities live, and that's based on calls for service. But that's not true either. As a commander in the department, I looked at the numbers of calls for service, and they were based on the west side of town, and that's where we had the majority of the officers assigned. First, the west side had the most numbers, and then the south side, because of the population. It was not the east side of San Jose, but still, the numbers did not jive with the population there, and the department saw, again, this is no excuse. In fact, it was kind of funny that after the study came out, 
and uh, prove the department's points. Somebody put this in my folder just as a joke to let me know that, hey, you went to the grand jury, but we, ha ha, it's not true. Um, so the racial profiling um, exists, you know, you know, on the part of law enforcement in their initial decision to concentrate their, re their resources in poor communities of color. Um, but then even after um, someone has been arrested, they find that the decision about whether they are going to be charged and for what crimes is also infected with racial bias. In fact, um, the Los Angeles Times reported that for, I think it was about an eight-year period of time, there were no white people um, who had ever been prosecuted in federal court for an offense related to crack cocaine, even though the majority of crack users are clearly and undeniably white. Um, so even, you know, this issue about who gets charged for what crimes can be infected with racial bias. I've heard the brouhaha that all crimes of violence are hate crimes. And no, I don't want to hear that. Uh, if people know anything at all about the history of race, of slavery, of disenfranchisement in this country, you have to know that hate is always in the mix. And, but again, you know, if we don't acknowledge it, we don't have to address it. If we don't address it, perhaps it'll go away. Or perhaps the people raising the issues will go away. I just think that the way that the criminal laws have been set up, the way that justice or injustice is administered in this country, um, creates a environment where uh, racism is tolerated. That racism is uh, something that everyone, I think, resists and and hopefully recognizes uh, when it's there. But one of the problems is, is that unless as a society we are prepared to uh, recognize or acknowledge that racism exists, uh, we're not going to be able to deal with it. It's time to ditch that unsightly UHF antenna. Why pay for a new TV to go digital when you can get Stratos and other preview channels in crystal clear digital quality with our compact and reliable Globo set-top boxes? Easy to set up with free technical support and a full one-year warranty. Simply plug in your existing Sky or other satellite dish. This exclusive offer is available now to Triangle and Stratos viewers for just $120. Um, well, one could argue that um, profit is a major motivator for the rapid expansion of the criminal justice system in recent years. Um, as we've seen the privatization of prisons, we've also seen the influence of large corporations um, in um, lobbying for tougher sentences and uh, attempting to increase um, the expanse of the criminal justice system um, overall. So certainly profit um, um, has been playing an increasing role in the criminal justice system in recent years. Well, you know, California is a perfect example of why uh, a, a big prison budget is the, is the wrong way to go. Um, California has uh, uh, the largest prison system in the nation. Um, California locks up more people than any other state in the nation. And uh, uh, the, w California used to be number one in education. California today is 41st in education and number one in prison spending. So when you look at those priorities, you really have to ask yourself, why is California making this choice? How is it that it's okay to go from number one in education to 41 and then to become the number one prison spender in the nation over the course of the last 20 years? Um, there's a couple of different um, things that are important to note. It, Spending, uh, massive prison spending is not only a budget busting strategy, it also destroys communities and destroys lives. The reality is that being tough on crime is, 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 is not actually what happens when you spend a lot of money. You're tough on people and you're tough on state budgets. You're not actually tough on crime. One of the biggest myths that is out there today is that big prisons 
where tons and tons of people, uh, one of the biggest myths that out, that's out there today is that spending a lot of money on prisons is somehow going to make communities safer. And that's just nothing but a myth. There's no relationship between massive prison budgets and reduced crime. There's never been a single study that has said this is the way to keep our community safer. In fact, instead what it does is it tears up communities, tears up families, puts young people in uh, youth prisons on their way to adult prisons, and destroys state budgets. What's interesting about what's happening now in the United States is you actually see a lot of states rethinking how much money they spend on prisons. Um, it, given the fact that you know the United States as a whole is in a huge uh, deficit period, states across the nation are in the same situation. You see places like Kentucky starting to think about early release programs, Michigan doing the same. Other states are taking very seriously the idea that maybe they made a wrong decision 20 years ago to sink all this money into prisons. California needs to do the same. California has yet to make the same choice, which is a choice of, look, let's not destroy communities and destroy the state budget at the same time. Let's divest in this budget-busting strategy, put money where it's actually going to change people's lives. If you really wanted to fight crime, if you really wanted to do something to fight the problems of crime that exist, you would really look at prevention, you would look at education, you would look at job programs, you would look at how to reduce um, ch child abuse, child neglect. Those are the kinds of things that we would be doing if we really cared about crime. Recently, an independent audit said that the California state prison system was a billion dollar failure. And I think that what they were uh, referring to is that you have this huge bureaucracy that was created to support the prisons. And you have a very strong uh, prison union uh, that was you know, very much involved in, in the uh, state political scene. And so you literally, I mean, have billions of dollars, almost $5 billion being spent on a prison industry, uh, building prisons, uh, paying for prison guards, expanding uh, our prison system. And it became sort of a self-perpetuating machine where um, you had the prison guard unions actually getting involved in local elections for judges and district attorneys and running. Uh, candidates against district attorneys uh, who weren't advocating for prison sentences. You have over one-third of the people who are in uh, prison now for life offenses uh, there for nonviolent offenses under the three strikes law. I uh, recently uh, uh, had an opportunity to uh, meet with uh, some representatives from the California Department of Corrections and what I learned is that there are more employees uh, in the uh, Department of Corrections than there are in the entire state school system, including the, the local schools as well. Some 47,000 employees. We're spending more money on prisons than we are on education in California. Particularly disturbing, I would find, is that 70% of the 165,000 in prison, 70% of those are parole violators. They have not committed a new crime, but they merely violated a condition of their parole. I do believe that people must be held accountable and that public safety is the ultimate goal. But I find it somewhat disturbing when I look at the disparate numbers and see that those numbers are actually a result of not individuals committing crimes, but merely violating a condition in their parole and sent back into our prison systems. You know, in the United States today, who is sent to prison? Um, and who remains free on the streets has as much to do with class and race um, as it does uh, with who is guilty of committing particular crimes. Um, you know, I would argue that mass incarceration in the United States is the latest generation of racialized social control. Um, you know, following slavery, Jim Crow emerged as a means of controlling the African American population for the political, economic, and social benefit of the white elite. Um, today, most people assume that there is no form of racialized social control akin to Jim Crow segregation or slavery in the United States. Um, but I think on closer examination, it becomes apparent that mass incarceration is the new Jim Crow. Um, it is a system of race, racialized social control that has both the purpose and the effect of controlling African American and Latino communities through extremely punitive measures. Well, I mean, the, the, the problem is that we have uh, two, we have at least two different systems of justice. 
Um, if you are a, a cocaine user in New Haven, Connecticut, if, and you're a student at Yale, you get help and a diploma. If you're a cocaine user and you live in New Haven and you live in a housing project three blocks away, you get 10 to 15 year prison sentences. And everybody knows it. It's the biggest open secret in America. And so all we're saying is that we want African American teenagers who make mistakes to be given the same treatment and given the same second chance that white kids in the suburbs are given. The statistics have shown there's identical drug use in the suburbs among teenagers as in the inner city. But the arrest rates are something like 50 to 1. And the conviction rates are more than that, or worse than that. And these young people are then felons for life, essentially unemployable, uh, ineligible for student loans, um, and scarred for life. Why? We have reached an all-time high here in the state of California. There are over 50,000 correctional employees, 165,000 men and women incarcerated in our prisons. The number at no time is going down. When I started in the prisons business, there was 30,000 people inside of our state prisons. There were 12 state prisons. Today, we have 33 state prisons, and it is continually growing. And I believe it is growing because people see that they can have a clear advantage to line their pockets with gold. Um, and even after um, you know, these folks are released from jail, they find themselves caught up in a web um, of laws and social structures um, that are remarkably similar um, to what existed during the Jim Crow era. Um, you know, former prisoners are often denied the right to vote. Um, they can be discriminated against legally in employment, housing, access to education, public benefits, um, virtually all of the same spheres that Jim Crow laws used to once uh, force people into a racial caste system. Um, so although today uh, you know, criminal laws are not explicitly race-based, uh, the enforcement of our drug laws in particular have helped to recreate a racial caste system in which huge segments of the African-American Latino community are now denied the right to vote and can be legally discriminated against um, in um, virtually all areas of public life. And so it's really creating a situation where we're putting all this money in the back end, that is waiting until people are sentenced to long prison sentences to expend resources, and we don't have money at the front end to fund after school programs and basic education uh, for young people. And so it's really a self-perpetuating uh, revolving door. One thing I think that people in America, white, black, brown, and otherwise, have to begin to understand. When you dump hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, six billion dollars in California alone last year for prisons, more money was spent in California on prisons than on four-year colleges and universities last year. When you spend that much money on something that basically just damages people and spits them back out the other side, the whole society suffers. Those, those dollars could have gone to health care, they could have gone to education, they could have gone to job creation, they could have gone to environmental cleanup, they could have gone to the things that we truly value that make our communities health, healthy, safe, and peaceful. Instead, they are feeding this big punishment industry that the worse it does, the bigger it gets. The worse it does, the more money it gets. That hurts everyone. This is not just a black problem, this is an American problem, and everybody needs to take a stand against it. I feel that prisons are really just a response to society. Prisons are not the ones that set this course, but they are rather the, the vehicles that they take the journey on. And so when you're looking at prisons and how prison operations is going, I think that you really are looking at society. And that's what's showing back in your face. And sometimes that ugliness that you see is quick to put it off and say, well, it's those prison staff that are doing it. But in actuality, it's each and every one of us American citizens people don't understand for the most part um, you know, how extraordinary the last 20 years have been in terms of the rate of mass incarceration and its consequences. And uh, because there is such considerable evidence that the war on drugs was no mere accident. In fact, you know, at the time Ronald Reagan launched the war on drugs, I think less than 3% of the general population view drugs as among the most important issues facing the nation. You know, most people think that the war on drugs um, emerged in response to um, you know, 
crack cocaine or violence that was emerging in the inner cities. But in fact, you know, the war on drugs was launched years before crack even showed up um, in the inner cities. And the emergence of crack in inner cities was you know, a, fortuit a fortuitous benefit to the Reagan administration and their efforts to justify their decision to uh, reallocate you know, millions of dollars in law enforcement resources to street crime, which had traditionally been the function of state and local uh, law enforcement, um, but under the Reagan administration, it suddenly become a massive federal priority. They've done studies, in fact, involving blacks. In fact, this one was done by Dom Shalala, who was the uh, Secretary of, the, of um, Health, I believe, at the time. And her study showed that actually black youths use less drugs than any other ethnic group. Yet, if you see in prison, blacks are, what, 85 to 90 percent of drug arrests. It doesn't uh, correlate. What happens is targeting. If you think in your mind that a certain people, certain people are the ones that are the suspects, that's where you're going to make your stops at. You see a, a car full of blacks, that's where you're going to stop and you're going to ask for a consent search. Now that's another issue I got involved in at San Jose. The fact that other departments have looked at consent searches and said, with San Francisco and the CHP in, and it says, we've done a study on this, and when officers are given that latitude of just stopping and searching and getting a consent search, who gets stopped and searched? There's blacks and Hispanics primarily. The uh, Public Defender's Office wasn't something that was created out of the sort of good of the government. Uh, what happened was is that 40 years ago, the United States Supreme Court decided a case, Gideon versus Wainwright, where uh, a, a person who would now be known as a three-striker wrote a handwritten petition to the Supreme Court saying, hey, it's not fair, I don't have a right to a lawyer. Because the law at that time only provided for a lawyer if you were charged with a death penalty offense. If you were charged with a non-death penalty offense, you were either on your own or you pled guilty. One of those two. You represented yourself or you pled guilty. And so uh, what we've seen over the last 40 years is uh, public defender's offices uh, popping up across the country. The problem with the Gideon case is that the Supreme Court didn't say how they were going to pay for it. And so there is no funding provision for public defender's offices. And it's pretty much a, has come from the individual counties. And uh, some counties are good in providing uh, funds for indigent defense, and most of them are not so good. And so when you talk about racial disparities, when you talk about um, the quality of justice, it really depends on how much justice uh, you're getting and uh, the resources. If you have a, a public defender who has 200 felony cases on her docket, you're not going to be able uh, to get the, the kind of attention that you need in your case. The people who are least able to defend themselves become the people who are the fodder for the drug war, who fill the prisons, who make the punishment industry profitable. Um, if you're a person of color, uh, often a jury is much more willing to see you as a teenager using drugs, as a drug gang member who needs to be gotten off the street. If you're white, oh well, maybe he's just having a bad summer. Maybe there's something going on in the home. Maybe he needs a second chance. Second chances, second chances are hard to come by if you're the wrong color. Um, in this country. And yet, um, you know, we know for a fact that George Bush's daughters um, have experimented with drugs. Nobody calls them drug pushers and says that they should be pulled out and yanked out of Yale and put into prison. In this country, it's amazing. If one of, if a middle class person's kid gets into trouble, they don't say, oh, I know, put this kid in prison for 10 years and that will make him a better person. We know what it takes to turn a kid, kid's life around. If a young person makes a mistake, and they do, all the time. In some communities, we say, hey, listen, second chances, um, counseling, help, let's talk to them. In other communities, we say, you're a bad person, you're a, you're a danger to society, you're a threat, and we're going to lock you up. And juries um, are very susceptible to this. Judges are susceptible to this. Um, and so the system works out in a way that people of color, the people who are least able to defend themselves, um, who who are marked from the moment they walk to the courtroom as likely to be criminals, 
Um, those are the people who pay the cost. Now, money enter, enters into this equation as well, but it is not the dominant factor. Low-income whites do not go to prison at the same rate as low-income blacks. Um, low-income whites do not go into prison at the same rate as low-income African Americans or Latinos. Um, there is a race, racial bias, a prejudgment, a prejudice in the minds of most people if they see a 19-year-old African American man who's accused of doing drugs, you think he probably did it. If you see a 19-year-old uh, white guy from the suburbs, uh, you assume, well, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't do it, should he really go to prison if he did it, maybe, maybe if he gets a second chance he'll do better with it, and you see that bias playing itself out over and over again. But what I do believe occurs, it goes back to the societal issues, that we raise the, the standard and we say that you must have car insurance, but in that inner city, the car insurance will cost you twice as much as it will in an affluent area. We also have people that are living on fixed incomes inside of that community. So therefore, that law enforcement officer, now when they stop you, there is a greater likelihood that you're not going to have the car insurance. So therefore, I can remove you. One of the big problems with criminal law is that as a matter of policy, uh, there hasn't been any long-range planning by political leadership. Rather, it's been more of a reaction and a campaign issue that results in certain legislation. And so without long-term criminal justice planning, you're not going to have the kind of um, social policy discussion uh, that uh, should be demanded. Uh, if we're talking about making society safer and we look at programs uh, that help uh, uh, blend people back into society, you know, that's some, a discussion that should be had. Rather, our criminal justice system is created by politicians who are really out to fulfill their own individual political agenda to get elected. And so we've seen a lot of reaction here in California. For example, the three strikes law. I mean, that was something that the politicians jumped on the bandwagon with. It was a catchy phrase. It was a reaction really to one big case uh, where people were outraged uh, that a person on parole had committed a new crime. And so they decided that they were going to uh, implement this three strikes law. What people, I think, didn't anticipate is that the three strikes law went too far by locking somebody up for life for stealing a piece of pizza, for stealing a bicycle. You know, what, what purpose does that serve except to fulfill uh, a particular politician's uh, political agenda to get reelected. Yeah, well, you know, if you look at the rise of the Get Tough on Crime movement, it can really be traced to uh, white segregationists um, in the 1950s who were opposed to the civil rights movement. Um, they were the first ones who began to call for law and order and a crackdown on crime and you know, attempted to characterize civil rights protesters as criminals and uh, acts of civil disobedience as being the type of crime that would lead to um, other types of criminal activity. In fact, um, former Vice President Richard Nixon said that you know, the criminality of civil rights protesters was you know, a direct cause of uh, rising crime rates, um, you know, referring to street crime. Um, so this kind of call for a crackdown um, on crime really originated with segregationists um, during the civil rights movement and has long been understood, uh, particularly among those who are hostile to civil rights, as essentially code language for cracking down on communities of color and for expressing support for um, a very conservative um, view of um, American social order. And I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that um, you know, the law and order and get tough on crime appeals has been employed strategically um, by kind of the new right conservatives as a means of appealing to particularly you know, white working class southern voters who have become disenchanted with the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement and affirmative action and who understand um, that cracking down on crime doesn't mean cracking down on their kids. You know, I think that the average American's perception of the criminal justice system is thrown off by these big celebrity trials where a Kobe Bryant or an O.J. Simpson gets off. In the vast majority of cases, 
if you are accused and you're African American, the public defender just tells you, go ahead and plead guilty. Most of these cases never even get in front of a jury because uh, uh, public defenders, rightly or wrongly, will tell an African American defendant, if you go before the jury, the jury is so likely to see you as a criminal that you may get three or four times what the DA is offering. Just go ahead and plead. Um, the public defender or public pretender, as they're often called in our community, um, is often complicit in uh, processing African American men and Latino men to jail in extraordinary numbers. I think that any person of conscience in this country should spend at least one day a year at the city hall, at the hall of justice in their community, and just sit there from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., a two-hour pilgrimage, and you will see, and I don't care where you live or how white your state is, you will see African-American man after African-American man after African-American man being sentenced to five years, 10 years, 12 years, day after day after day for offenses that frankly are happening in the suburbs, drug use and drug sales every day without even an arrest, let alone a conviction in these extraordinary long sentences. If you look at the criminal laws in, in this country, you will see uh, a, a long history going back 150 years where criminal laws were created in order to discriminate against minorities. Here in California, we had a law that prohibited uh, any person of color from testifying in a criminal case, serving as uh, members of a jury. And once someone has been convicted of a crime, uh, they find that the sentences that are imposed um, are often much lengthier um, for those who are folks um, of color. Um, often they will have had a lengthier history of interaction with law enforcement precisely because law enforcement has concentrated their resources in communities of color and um, has begun stopping and searching them often at a very young age. Um, and they find themselves going away for much longer periods of time. We went to the grand jury also about uh, the number of profile stops involving young people and some of these same numbers. In fact, when the, the black officers did their study, we actually went and looked at car stops and pedestrian stops one year. At that time, the black population was about 5%. It's been dropping in San Jose. Yet, they, we were 15% of the stops. That's 300%. 300%. The, the, I also did a study looking at the uh, juvenile hall, the population there, 15%. The population for a county jail, for blacks again, 15%. You see the correlation there. Stops results in arrest, or res res arrest results in incarceration. Well, in this country, the quality of justice that a person receives is not supposed to depend on the size of their wallet. However, I think most people know that it does, that the reality is that if you can afford to hire Johnny Cochran or you can afford to hire some big shot lawyer to come in and do your case, you're going to get more justice. You're going to get a higher quality of justice. And the reason behind that is not only being able to hire a high priced lawyer, but also being able to hire experts and the other people that you need to really uh, meet the challenge of mounting a uh, defense. And again, if you look at the resources that are afforded to the prosecution versus the defense, the defense is easily overwhelmed. And if you look at across the country, the quality of justice that is provided to poor people, to indigent people, you will find wide disparities. Uh, in some states, there are lawyers who have literally thousands of felony cases that they handle a year for pennies. And the people who are represented by those attorneys often are people of color. You can even be denied the ability to obtain an education because you've been incarcerated. Virtually all colleges and universities ask whether you've been incarcerated may discriminate against you on that basis. Um, you know, if our prison population was relatively small, uh, this might not be reason for concern. Um, but given that there's currently two million people behind bars in the United States, and that the overwhelming majority of those people are people of color, and that one in three young African-American men today are currently under the control of the criminal justice system, suddenly uh, you know, this form of legalized discrimination um, you know, and everything from employment and education to housing um, begins to look and feel a lot more like uh, the type of discrimination that was part of our ugly past. One good example are the statistics from the Department of Justice which clearly shows that the death penalty is administered more often uh, to people of color 
uh, than, um, than non-minorities. And again, uh, one argument that's been put out there is that while there are more people of color who commit death penalty uh, eligible offenses, and actually the opposite is true, that if you look at the numbers, you will see that most of the people who are eligible for the death penalty are not people of color. And so when you start looking at those kinds of statistics, you can only reach a conclusion, as I think the Department of Justice has and, and other agencies who have studied this, that race is a factor, race is a problem. And yeah, you know, the Clinton administration escalated the war on drugs. Um, and Clinton himself said that, you know, he would never let you know, any Republican appear to be tougher on crime than he was. So far from, um, you know, rejecting um, the law and order and get tough on crime rhetoric, he felt that what it meant to be a new Democrat was to embrace it um, and to prove that he could be as tough on them um, as any Republican. And, you know, certainly his decision to oversee the execution of a mentally retarded black man within weeks of the New Hampshire primary and um, to make a big show about it was um, partly, you know, an effort to prove that he was, he was serious um, in his willingness to crack down on the communities that, um, you know, the Republicans had had so much success in um, using to their political advantage in the and past. And now he's strategically placed his office in a primarily African-American neighborhood in Harlem. And so I guess we get mixed signals from where, you know, his priorities really are. You know, well, you know, I think one of my biggest concerns is that um, the war on drugs isn't more widely understood, even within the African-American community, as uh, turning the clock back on the gains that were made in the civil rights movement. You know, we need to start holding politicians accountable. When they say they're law and order and pro-public safety, and yet they vote for budgets that destroy after-school programs, undercut schools, undercut job, jobs for youth, and give all the money to police and prisons, that is a pro-crime budget. And we need to, and the soccer moms of America and the, the, the basketball coaches of America, the preachers, the teachers, the ordinary people have to start saying, we're seeing through this now. After 20, 30 year unbroken run of more money going toward incarceration than you know, toward higher education, um, we see through that now. And we have to start saying, as a community, as voters, we have, we have to start saying that the pro-crime politicians are the politicians that are handing over the public treasury to the incarcerators and not funding the things that we know keep kids out of trouble. That those are the pro-crime politicians. And that the tough on crime, the smart on crime politicians who are trying to have a mix of investments in young people are the ones who deserve our support. Changing face of New Zealand is opening doors to new local markets. As our community becomes more multicultural, you can rely on our dedicated people to make an impact with your advertising dollar in market sectors you've never reached before. Right, you know, there's, the you know, police department has this little saying among the officers that we're all blue and that we don't have uh, color, we don't have sex there. And yet, there are differences there. Uh, we, as black officers, have done studies there in San Jose Police Department in which we looked at retention rates. The retention rate, the non-retention rate, rather, for white males was 13% in our study. The non-retention rate for black females was over 50%. For black males, it was 45%. For, for Latin Americans, it was over 40%. For Asians, it was over 40%. And they said, well, that's not our fault. It's not our problem. They'll talk about, well, we can't retain them. We can't uh, recruit them. You go to other departments, there are black and women administrators all throughout the department. When you look at San Jose, the numbers are very low. We at one point had not one single, I'm sorry, we had one black supervisor assigned to the detective bureau. Now, the detective, that's a nice job. You get up there. Only one black supervisor there out of over 200 officers. And so we raised that question, why? Well, we can't get them up here. They're not qualified to work up here. We then got four candidates that we said have applied for jobs there. Between these four candidates, three of them had master's degrees. 
One of them was the acting chief of police at another agency. And yet they're saying these people are not qualified to work as detective supervisors. It's total lies. Yeah, it's total lies. So then, so when we, after we pressed it, within six months, we had then five black supervisors assigned to the bureau. Five percent. Five, five, total five. Out of 200. Out of 200. So that's one percent. Yes. And they say, again, that's acceptable. You know, that kind of harkens back to the old uh, melting pot theory that we'll all get in here and we'll all be the same and we'll, and we'll embrace each other and sing kumbaya. That's a bunch of crap. Yeah, if there's, if we're all blue, they got some light blue, some dark blue, some off blue, you know, that's, that's, that's the, that's a way of avoiding the issue. The issue is that race in this country has always been a factor. Nobody wants to really deal with it because when you deal with the issue of race, you have to deal with the damages that were done by slavery. You have to deal with the fact that Reconstruction was only an attempt to correct some awful injuries. You have to deal with the fact that Jim Crow and de facto and de jure discrimination existed in this country until the relative near past. You have to deal with the fact that black folks and other people of color are the last hired and oftentimes the first fired. You have to deal with the fact that there are differentials in terms of longevity in this country and a lot of those have to do with discrimination. You have to deal with the fact that blacks and browns still have difficulty getting home loans, that they're charged more for auto insurance, that they can't get health insurance. It goes back to the societal issues, that we raise the, the standard and we say that you must have car insurance, but in that inner city, the car insurance will cost you twice as much as it will in an affluent area. We also have people that are living on fixed incomes inside of that community. So therefore, that law enforcement officer, now when they stop you, there is a greater likelihood that you're not going to have the car insurance. So therefore, I can remove you. We then put laws in place that say, and they are well-intended laws, but say you must have a child seat in that vehicle. Well, if you're a single mother, you have four kids, and a child seat costs you $100 a seat, you don't have $400 that you can spend, but you still got to get your kids to school. You still have to pick them up from school. Now, these communities often will be filled with individuals that are uh, people of color, Latinos, uh, African-Americans, Asians, that are trying to survive here in, in the state of California on these fixed incomes. And then we attach all of these restrictions, and then we bring in a layer of review that review from law enforcement or from other governmental agencies and I think that that's what tends to add to it but I wouldn't want to say that I could quantify that they actually profile you but rather I think it's a set of circumstances that are created so that the likelihood is much greater that when I stop a person in an inner city they will most likely one not have their driver's license two not have their their insurance, three, their car may not be properly smog. I mean, there is a series of issues that I can then address as a law enforcement agency that once I go to a more affluent area, those will no longer be concerns for those individuals. So, you know, I, you, you don't need a written policy um, that says we profile in order to demonstrate that police uh, profile people of color all the time. Um, there's a couple of different dynamics that I think are really important to talk about. One is that, uh, there's a decision that's made about what to do with a person when you uh, find a person who may or may not have uh, done something illegal. Um, the decision to take someone into the, to the police department station is a decision that police make all the time. And they're making that decision based on their assumptions about how violent a person is, about how dangerous a person is, about how uh, uh, guilty a person is. Police are making decisions to either put a person into a system 
um, or leave the person on the street, let the person go. That decision right there, all the time you'll see. The, their thinking about whether or not a person is dangerous um, is very much a racialized decision. So you have uh, racialized decisions at the level of the police, and then you see that all the way up through the system. One of the things that I always find um, uh, very disturbing is reading probation department reports about young people in the system. There's a very, very different way in which young people of color are written about and talked about in these reports that go to judges than white kids are. Um, you'll see all the time, you'll see probation department uh, reports, um, you know, uh, mother seems unstable, um, you know, child seems aggressive, those kinds of comments being made, which are essentially profiling comments um, in the reports that go to the judges um, that probation department officers uh, uh, write. And then you'll see the same kid, a white kid, with the same circumstances, and the report saying, you know, I think he feels bad about what he did, I, you know, it seems like his mom's concerned, and those reports going to the judges. So you see a very different way in which um, police, probation officers, district attorneys, and judges are assuming that uh, the person, um, that a very different way in which um, these, these officials are um, treating people of color versus white people. My understanding, again, this comes from some of the persons that work with, with uh, counting the numbers, is that once we went to the grand jury, and our grand jury testimony was based on lots of things, studies that we had done ourselves as black officers, independently of the department, and also on complaints from the citizens. You know, I go into the community, and I, I do a lot of community service while I was there at the police department, and so you get a chance to talk to people. I went to classrooms, I went into youth centers and so forth, and I kept hearing the same message. We're getting stopped, we're getting searched. And the department come out, in fact, in their studies and said they only had 15 complaints of racial profiling. I can go into a classroom, and say it's a classroom that has black students and it could be African American studies or something like this, and ask them, raise your hand if you've been stopped and you feel like you've been racially profiled, every single hand goes up. That's 30 hands right there. Not just one classroom. It's just one classroom. You know? They're not, but again, they don't complain because they feel like the system's not going to listen to them anyway, so why even bother? And it's also what the department says. Well, it wasn't so much a, 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 a profiling complaint, it was a harassment complaint, or was a policy or procedure complaint and they'll keep changing it that way. But uh, when we went to the grand jury, we talked about the numbers. Now, while our numbers we were hearing were, again, from the community, it was occurring. The department, though, their numbers they used were based on the, they had a certain criteria that the, that the district attorneys had. The person had to be a confirmed gang member to be in this particular database. And there were only a few dozen people that were in that database. But all in all, she had to do in the field on what we call a field interrogation car, was put the letter G. G means gang member. Only you think it's a gang member. All you have to do is look at a person, and if they have tattoos or clothing, whatever, they're sagging and bagging, as the kids did, and they look at it and say, oh, this person here is sagging and bagging, and they'll put a G on there, and that will be put in the system as a possible gang member. That computer system is not what the grand jury looked at. They looked at what the department showed them which had the, the district attorney's criteria, which is totally different. I knew kids, and my wife and I worked with kids, who were so-called sagging and bagging. In fact, one young man, I'm very proud of him, he was supposed to be sagging and bagging at times, too. This young man actually uh, just finished, I think, last year at Yale University. He went on to Cambridge University, and he's now as a medical student. So clothing means nothing, it's just style. It means nothing, it's just a style. I remember when we were kids, we were a lot worse than that. Remember the, the hip huggers and the, and the, um, the, the hot pants? We were looking a lot worse than our kids look today. We, have, uh, we conduct English classes here. And a lot of the people that come to the English classes are young workers. They're young workers. And uh, they're in the evening. Uh, and so they come here to learn English so that they can, are able to survive. Well, many of them have had experience with, uh, with the police abuse coming out of, of the class, uh, where, where, you know, uh, automatically they incriminate them on criminal acts. I mean, we had to, we had to uh, serve as testimony that the individual was in the English class 
while that particular crime was going on and we had to testify. Um, we've had, for example, uh, young workers that have been stopped here by the police. Automatically, you have drugs, where are they? Without investigating. And there, you know, a lot of them um, not only come uh, here uh, to school, but they also work at night. A lot of them are janitors. So they're stopped by the police when they, when they leave their, um, their job around two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, and automatically the police stops them and harasses them. Many of them are undocumented. So one of the laws that exists is that undocumented people cannot even have a driver's license so that they can work in these low paying jobs uh, and you know, jobs that no, no one else wants. Uh, so they are, they're the ones that are, that are doing these kinds of jobs and they're being harassed and stopped. There's, there's constant uh, checkpoints right here on 2nd Street where, they're, you, where they stop the cars. If they see a man, especially men, uh, brown skinned men, they will stop him automatically without, even if he didn't violate any laws, they will stop them automatically. These are the kinds of checkpoints that exist in the barrios. If you drive and if you walk, if you walk on the street, they do the same thing. There's checkpoints for people. They ask, uh, you know, for, you know, um, uh, they not only ask for your identification, but they just, you know, continuously ask questions. Uh, and many times, you know, they discover that they're undocumented people. So, so they work hand in hand with the immigration department. So there's constant harassment, constant harassment especially for young workers. Uh, another example of something that occurred at our department was um, the issue in briefing with the, uh, the officer wearing a Klan outfit in briefing. Uh, this type of thing in the history that I've been at the department is the worst thing that ever occurred there. It's something that I uh, give a comparison. I would say back in the 1960s when Bull was involved as the chief of police in Birmingham, Alabama at the time of the child killings and the church bombing, he would have never allowed his officers to wear Klan apparel to briefing. He wouldn't even have done that in the 60s. Here you have an officer that back in 2003 was doing an interview and in his interview they were talking about some of the things he did back in the late 80s in the San Diego Police Department. And one of the instances was an officer um, was wearing a German hat and doing the entire briefing in what he called a German accent. Now, the period of time they, uh, they had was World War II. We look at, again, the Holocaust of World War II and the connection there. Again, complete insensitivity. On December 7th, he came, the same officer came to briefing wearing a Japanese uniform and trying to do briefing in a Japanese uh, voice and mocking a Japanese officer and saying this was his birthday. December 7th was his, was his uh, person's birthday, in which it was not. But uh, personally, I was offended by both those two incidents, but the worst incident occurred, uh, in my opinion, is when he came to briefing wearing a Klan's uh, hood. It was an actual Klan's hood that was taken during a demonstration a few years before then. The one officer was going to be leaving going to Alabama, and so they thought as a joke they were wearing this Klan helmet in briefing so we can get a taste of what's going to be like going to Alabama. Uh, when you look at the overall operation of the criminal justice system, where so many young people are sent off to jail, um, damaged in jail, sent back, unemployable, labeled as felons, um, the total is a net loss for our communities. Why can't we have a criminal justice system that actually helps our communities, that lifts up our communities rather than locking them down and destroying their futures? That is what's ultimately at stake. It's not just a question of racism or class. It's a question of what kind of investments are we making in our communities? Are we investing in police and prisons and saying that's a public safety strategy? The safest communities have the best jobs, education, no police and no prisons. So if we want public safety or community safety, if that's the value, Let's have the same strategy in the inner city that's working in the suburbs. 
the uh, next step is, you know, how do we solve it? How do we go about uh, eradicating uh, race as a, a factor? And it is going to take, I think, really a social movement uh, towards uh, making sure that the laws uh, are uh, drafted in a way so as not to discriminate, uh, discriminate against certain type of people. The attitude in the, in the United States is that I don't worry about Jonesy's kids. I only got to worry about mine, and I have them living in this gated community. But you know what? They've got to walk out of that gated community to go to the theater, to go to the shopping mall, to go to the bus depot, to go down to the Fisherman's Wharf, and that's when they're going to encounter Jonesy's kids, and they become victims of crime. So I think that there's a lot. I think also that we're looking at this as a, as a societal problem, because right now when you drive down the road, and you hit that pothole, when you go down and you need emergency care but the emergency room has been closed, when you look over and you see that grammar school that's been closed and all the kids have been bused to another school, why is that happening? It's happening because we're funneling all of our monies into our prison systems, into investigations to capture lawbreakers, where if we get in front of this issue and we raise people to be good citizens, we raise people to obey laws, we teach people how to socialize and interact with others, I think that you'll find that you'll have a better society. And this is something that could occur in 10 years. You could be able to see the results of that type of an effort or investment into our own. Yeah, one thing we need to begin looking at is how we re rehabilitate people back into society. And I think one of the problems or failures of our prison system is that we have not done a good job of doing that. That if you look at uh, the the resources that are available to a person once they're released back into to the community in California, you'll get your gate money and that's about it, which is usually a few hundred dollars, and you're released. I just had a client who was released after 13 years in prison, and a federal judge released him after it was determined that he and his co-defendant were innocent. All they were given or offered was the gate money. There was no um, training programs, no vocational programs, no um, opportunities uh, afforded to these two individuals who, mind you, spent 13 years in a crime for a crime that they were innocent of. And so you can imagine what happens to people who are released on parole. And so uh, I think that it's high time that uh, California, uh, in following uh, you know, some of the leads, I, I think, well, I think it's high time that uh, in states like California that incarcerate a lot of people need to look at how we better rehabilitate people back in society because if we don't do that then they're going to be back. The state of California's criminal justice system has been dominated um, by uh, politics for 20, 20 plus years. The uh, prison guards union, the uh, pro-prison lobby in California um, um, has basically been in the pockets of politicians supporting tough, uh, uh, tough sentencing laws, supporting excessive uh, punishment laws, supporting putting young people in um, adult prisons at a younger age, three strikes, all of the sort of really harsh mandatory incarceration, mandatory sentencing policies in the state of California have been funded by and supported by the pro-prison lobby, um, which is the prison guards union here in the state. So there needs to be a, a, a growing voice of, of opposition to that, um, to that power that the prison guards union here has, in has here in California. Uh, police officers unions give the big endorsements, they give the big donations, and they defend often the worst offenders in the department. Um, and they're often proud of the, you know, they're able to keep people from being fired. Uh, what we say is that our definition of a good cop is a cop who will enforce the law against another cop and will uphold the law uh, within the department as well as outside the department. And so what we're saying is that if you want African Americans to not uh, be killed at these extraordinary rates, even in a place like San Francisco, police officers have to know that if they pull their gun and they pull the trigger and it's unwarranted, that there will be a penalty, they will pay a cost. Any other reform from integration to uh, education to tolerance workshops will be meaningless as long as the officers who are the most violent get the most promotions.
We need to take California back from the prison guards union. We need to educate judges, educate district attorneys, educate police officers about the experiences that people are having in the criminal justice system, how it's a, a failed model. It's not going to make communities safer. It's only going to harm communities, especially low-income communities of color. Um, we need to really push for an honest assessment of where are we at here, where are we at after over 20 years of building the biggest prison system in the world, who has been helped by this? Well, the only people who've been helped are the people who are making money off of it. Communities aren't safer. Uh, 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 racialized uh, treatment um, and discriminatory treatment of people of color is um, at an all-time high in the criminal justice system. And you have states um, with no money uh, to spend on education, job programs, and health care. Now, we need to turn that around and take that back. We need to reverse this trade-off and put, we need to put the money back into the systems that support opportunities and take the money away from the systems that harm communities. Well, you know, the war on drugs and the war on terrorism um, may have in common uh, the feature of being wars that, um, you know, may well go on in perpetuity and it's not at all clear that those who are waging the wars want to win them as much as that they want to continue to wage them. Well, I don't think jail is really the answer. I think the jail is the tail wagging the dog. That's where the bottom line falls and it becomes very visible what is occurring around us. But I think really what we need to get back to are some basics and that is that we have to again reinvest in the Americans, our American citizens. It's my hope that one day we will have a society that is colorblind and we will have a society that can enforce laws or prosecute laws without regard to race. But uh, unless we make fundamental changes in the very institution of criminal and juvenile justice, that will not happen for some time.